Hi, and welcome to Season 4 of Beyond Teaching, brought to you by the Psych Sessions Network. This series is hosted by Susan Nolan from Seton Hall University, Adyinka Akinsular smith from City College of New York, City University of New York, Asani Sewell from LGS Legacy Weight Diabetes Institute, and yours truly, Eric Landrum from Boise State University. For now, the Psych Sessions podcast, Beyond Teaching, is all about the teaching, research, and clinical skills that psychological scientists need to know about to be successful. You know, all the survival skills needed to thrive in the academic or clinical workspace beyond your formal graduate school training, all the stuff that we were never taught while we were in the graduate school classroom. For season four, we have 12 episodes in store for you with a weekly release starting July 2022 and delightfully stretching into October 2022, helping you make that transition from summer to fall, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, that is, whether you are on the semester system or the quarter system. What's in store? We'll discuss the importance of staying up to date, helping students with personal statements and spark birds, student researchers, what a unionized campus looks like, a peek at the life of adjuncts, adjunct faculty from two different perspectives, interacting with the media, uh-oh, cleaning out your office, and it might not be one of the four of us you thought it would be, <laughs> saying yes or no, and Maria Banford's advice about that topic, ascension and doctoral versatility, dealing with professorial conflicts, and taking tenure out for a spin and career sustainability in the face of the great resignation, or what you might call the big quit. In season four, we also had guests join us for three of the 12 episodes. I'm not going to tell you who or which episodes. That way you'll be curious and you'll want to listen in in order to satisfy that natural curiosity that you have. So there. Please enjoy season four of Beyond Teaching. Welcome back to a special episode of Beyond Teaching. We're thrilled to be here today because although we dearly miss Asani, who won't be with us, we have a special guest. But before we get to our special guest, I am Eric Landrum from Boise State with my two colleagues. Yinka Kinchler smith from the City College of New York, CUNY. And Susan Nolan from Seton Hall University. And there are plenty of times when we talk about things that we don't have expertise in. And most of the time, that doesn't stop us from talking about them. But occasionally, we actually need to reach out and talk to someone. And one of the things that came up in a recent conversation was, I believe, Susan, you mentioned that there are folks on your campus that are starting to talk about unionizing. Is that correct? Yes, we have a chapter now of AAUP with, I imagine the goal is ultimately unionizing. I'm just so naive about all of that, you know, pro-union, but I don't really know what it even means to be a unionized faculty and how that affects shared governance. Just, I, I just have a million unformed questions. And so we thought, let's get somebody who does know what it's like to be a unionized faculty member. And so we brought in the fabulous Vinnie Prohaska from Lehman college. And Vinny, do you want to maybe say a little bit about yourself before we kick off our Q&A? Well, I just, again, Vinny Prohaska from Lehman College, City University of New York, where I've been for, yeah, a little over 30 years now and been a union member that whole time. I'm not an official in the union. I'm not an officer in my chapter, just a happy member. And Vinny, so were you there now, did you cut the limestone for the first building or were you just there for its dedication? The no, the, 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 the first buildings at Lehman were actually built in the 1930s. So you were there in year two then? So I was, there, I was there just after that. It was built and then the United Nations was there. The first meetings of the General Assembly were on the Lehman campus. And then after that, it was a branch of Hunter College. It was the Hunter College School for Girls that contained the education programs and the psychology programs. And then in 1968, it became Herbert H. Lehman College. Okay, very good. Well, the United I Nations- I love hearing link, this history. The United Nations link is strong because Susan and Yinka, isn't that your connection? Isn't that where you met? Yeah. UN work together? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 
So it's a small world after all. At Boise State, we are not a union shop. Unions are basically illegal in Idaho, except for a couple of exceptions. We are, and I'm using air quotes for our listeners, a right to work state, which has its own irony. Susan's exactly right. We wanted to have you on, Vinny, because I had remembered some conversations and hearing you talk about being in a union shop and remembering that you were genuinely positive, if I'm, if I'm getting that recollection correct. Yeah, absolutely. So Susan, did you want to ask questions or, or Yinka or just have any kind of kind we... of uh, go off and tell us about his experiences? How do you want to proceed? I mean, I'm kind of wanting to hear what he has to say. I mean, I'm part of the City University of New York too, and I am a union member, but I don't, I'm not well-versed. So, you know, I want to hear more. So that means you haven't paid your dues. Is that right? No, I have been paying my dues. They come out, they come out of that paycheck every other week, but I'm just not active. Okay. Yeah, I just, I'm, I'm just curious about, you know, what does it mean for the day-to-day -day life, if anything, of a faculty member? How, how does the union, what role does the union play in your life as a faculty member? Just, I really, my, my questions are somewhat unformed because I know so little about what it means to be a unionist faculty. Anywhere you want to start, Vinny. That, it, inter interesting, because I'm thinking, gee, I don't know what it is to be a non-union <laughs> faculty. So when I think about it, so 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 maybe I'll, I'll, I'll turn the tables a little bit. So Susan, like, how, how do you get pay raises? How do you get health insurance? Who controls your tenure and promotion processes? Okay, so I'll, I'll answer those quickly. Pay raises, you get cost of living if you're lucky. Sometimes they cancel it because they don't have money. You can go up for a faculty merit pay raise, which is a long process. Our health insurance, there's a compensation committee that does involve faculty that weighs in, but ultimately that decision is made by the university. And rank and tenure goes through department, committee, college committee, dean, university committee, provost. Okay, so the... The, the the difference with the union is is not really that much because the union through collective bargaining will negotiate our salaries. So that's done. Can't always say it's cost of living. Can't always say sometimes we go years without, especially, you know, here being a public institution that's never been funded adequately at all. But all that is handled through collective bargaining and they take care of the the, the salaries, health benefits. They also look out for health and safety, and that's really been noticeable during the pandemic. The union has really been on the forefront of making sure that when we return to classes, we're returning classes to classes in a very safe way and protecting us and sort of protecting our ability to not return to class if we're not feeling that it's a safe thing to do. So a lot of those things that I think you find yourself as a faculty member maybe having to negotiate individually. The union sort of steps in and takes care of that. I remember when I was in graduate school, you know, the old story about how the only way you ever got a faculty pay raise was by getting a job offer from somewhere else and then trying to get your school to match it or let you walk. Again, you, that's not something we have to worry about at all. The limitation is if, if you feel like, oh, you're a real entrepreneur, I'm worth twice what everybody else in my department is worth, and I can go to the dean and make that case, you don't have that kind of option in a union shop. Yeah, that doesn't happen in non-union places either. <laughs> However, if you are being underpaid and undervalued, you can go to the union and have people stand, stick up for you because I actually had that situation. Oh, that's interesting. Right. I wouldn't know where. I, I think if I had that situation, I would have to get my own attorney or something. I wouldn't even know where to begin with a situation like that. And also they couldn't, I'm going to guess, they couldn't drop your salary, right? Like our salaries got cut during the pandemic and they probably can't do that with the union. No, no way. No. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. That's interesting. And the faculty had very little say in, in I mean, we were just told what the health and safety we're going wow. to be for the pandemic. I think that's more typical than not. So I'm, I'm seeing some real value to having a union. So hey, I'm, Oh, sorry, go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, so I'm assuming are all the CUNY campuses part of the same union? Yes. I was, I was hoping there was a natural control group in there where there was just 
maybe one or two campuses. Again, we have this, we, we, we're part of AFT, American Federation of Teachers. It's a voluntary thing that's relatively small on our campus. And I, I, I'm with Susan, I, I can see the benefit, you know, when we, we don't negotiate, there's not one unitary negotiator that stands up for us and says, we want a 2.1% cost of living increase. And then we want a pool of 6.5% for merit and another 3% for equity. You know, there's not one unitary voice on our campus that says that for the faculty and then another for classified staff, another one for professional staff. There just isn't, there, there's no collective bargaining. There is not even individual bargaining. I mean, I think we're conditioned to accept what we're told and thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. May I have my job again next year? You know, I think that's kind of the attitude that we're in and I don't think it's very healthy. I think there's a lot of benefit I can see from a union shop. Yes. And again, as a, and then this probably wouldn't, wouldn't apply Susan so much to your case, but I think another advantage because we're a public institution is the union does a lot of lobbying in a state legislature because that's ultimately where our budget is coming from. So the union spends a lot of its energies lobbying in our case in Albany on our behalf. And again, that's something that individually as individual faculty member, not going to get a lot of traction. Good point. Uh, what about complaints against a faculty member by a student or whoever? Does that go through the union as well? Or is that through a different process, like an ombudsperson? That can go through an ombudsperson. But if that complaint is in a way being misused, that could go to the union grievance procedure. Anytime a faculty member feels they've been treated unfairly or their contractual rights have been violated, they can go through the union grievance procedure. So you've got a union grievance officer to talk to first. And they then will negotiate with the college about it and decide whether it needs, whether it's something that can be settled internally or needs to go through the formal grievance procedure. Are there regular union meetings that people attend? Yes. In fact, oh, there's okay. one going on right now, but. <laughs> Ironic. That and our campus, <laughs> similar, the, you know, the campuses are all divided into chapters. So we each have our own local chapter of the union, just most of the work for us. And then there's the central union that's system-wide, sort of as a parallel to the CUNY itself. Individual colleges, individual campuses, all reporting as part of the system. So you would have separate union meetings of your campus and then separate, like, because we have meetings of the College of Arts and Sciences. I mean, you have your own faculty meetings that are not union meetings, right? Like there would be two separate parallel sort of tracks. Correct, yeah. And how often does the union meet? The union usually meets maybe once a month, maybe once every six weeks. And how, how, what percentage of faculty members do you think attend those meetings? Oh, it's tiny. Tiny. It, okay. it, yeah, it's, it, 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 it's tiny. I suspect that, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, this is a lot like PBS, meaning that there are people on your campus and both Yinka and Vinny, you're, you're members of your, your union and you pay in, but there are benefits on your campus for people who don't pay. In other words, a very small percentage of people who watch PBS actually contribute to PBS, but we all benefit because we all get access to PBS. I would imagine that, that you're, even if you're not part of collective bargaining, and you're not a union member and you don't pay dues on your campus, the presence of a union on your campus benefits all. Is that accurate or in it? Uh, the, the second part is very accurate. Union benefits to all. The first part, again, New York versus Idaho, I think. We're a union shop. Oh, so everyone yeah. has to be part of it. Everyone is paying. So you cannot opt. So if I were to interview at a CUNY school, and, and accept the job there, I will be a member of the union, period. No, you will, you oh. will pay the agency fee. So oh. the, the equivalent of union dues is going to come out of your paycheck. You do not have to join the union. Well, interesting. Okay. But we still have the, the right to collect that piece because we are a union shop. Gotcha. Uh, the big plus is if you become a member of the union, 
you could deduct those union dues because they are union dues, not agency shop. Oh, so, so because so of if, tax deduction. So if I it's, choose it's, not to join and I pay this money, who gets the money? The union? The union gets the money okay. and you get all the benefits. You There is no separation in terms of a faculty member. You would still be represented in a grievance by the Why union. Why would I not join then? You know, I some people have, uh, I think, an aversion to being union members. I don't understand it. Some people, it's one of those like, why are people organ donors? Some people just don't ever get around to filling out the form to say, yes, I want to be in. Uh, and there, there has been a bit of a recent movement to for people to leave the union because there was some stuff that was being circulated not too long ago. There, there are periodically, we've gone through this periodic revolt. Union will make a decision or take a stand on an issue that some people will not approve of, and they will, you know, leave the union or tear up the union membership, encourage others. Which is symbolic at best, because they can tear up their electronic union card, but they're still paying. Right. And they're still getting the benefits. They're, they're still in our health plan. They're still getting whatever we get. Yeah. There's no distinction made there. So it's very, it, it is very symbolic. Mm -hmm. Really interesting. But, you know, some things that, you know, the union has, has, has gotten recently, I was thinking of what, you know, what's been the value for, for me of the union. Things that I necessarily wouldn't have had on my short list of things I definitely want, want to see. But several years ago, the union got our teaching loads reduced. We went from a 21-hour teaching load per year to an 18-hour teaching load oh. per year, which is a big, significant drop. It, it made a lot. New faculty who are hired, you know, young assistant professors, get 18 hours of release time that they can use over their first five years as they're preparing wow. for tenure. And they can work out with their department chairs exactly how they're going to use it, whether they want, you know, one course off per semester or want to take an entire semester off. So they've got plus. That was something I didn't have when I first joined Lehman. That's been a recent addition to it. Right. And so at a place like Seton Hall, we actually did go from a 24 to an 18 shortly after I arrived. And that was an initiative by a dean. So we, we needed an administrator to decide to do this and find a way to make it happen. And I think if the faculty had rabble roused for that, and, and I, I think Seton Hall is, is, is not unusual. I think we're very typical for non-union places. You, you, we, we couldn't have rabble roused and made that happen. Yeah. So here, it, I mean, it took the, you know, collective bargaining negotiations, but yeah, it happened. It was something that, yes, we had always complained about, but never thought we could do anything. And whom does the union leadership negotiate with at the university? Provost, deans? No, they they negotiate with the central administration, so with the chancellor's office. Okay. Everything, because it's all system-wide, so it's done at the chancellor's level. You do have, again, because we've got this decentralized structure, like our union leadership meets twice a semester with our college president and with members of the cabinet to, you know, go over what our local issues may be. What's the incentive to be union leadership? Do they get a course reduction or more money or just like a, a, a no pun intended, labor of love? Good question. I'm not sure at the chapter level. The chapter president might get some release time, but I'm not positive. Mm -hmm. Does it happen occasionally where the union or the union contract kind of traps itself, meaning, you know, the reduction of 21 teaching hours to 18 sounds like a 3-4 a teaching load to a 3-3, three, three, which sounds great. But but what if what if a chair wanted to say, Vinny, I got a, I got a special project for you. I don't want you teaching a 3-3. Three, three. For the next two years, I want you teaching a 2-2 two, two and doing this special thing. But gosh darn it, the union's got me trapped and you have to teach a 3-3. Three, three. No, because reassigned time is always an option. Okay. That is available on the individual campus. So so you don't get your hands tied in un, undesirable ways. No. Okay. Okay. And and speaking as a department chairs, department chairs don't get what's the polite way to say it? They don't get dumb about it, meaning 
well, the contract says you're going to do this. So I get to make you do this. Well, a department chair could get dumb about it, but remember at our shop, two department chairs were elected. So if you do that too often, okay, you're not going to stay. In yeah. This has been really helpful. I wondered, Vinny, if you might just tell us a little bit about Lehman College at CUNY, just to get a sense of place of where you are, what it's numbers of students and faculty and exactly how many psych majors, how many faculty, that'd be awesome. Oh, how many psych majors? I think we've got somewhere just under a thousand psych majors. Wait, what? I think we've got just under a thousand, I think we're at 900 at this point. It's, it's hard to count because our system doesn't do a good job of eliminating dropouts as they drop. So, or, or is the, if they take a semester off, if they take a year off, they're still counted in our numbers. So semester to semester, probably maybe 600 active. Okay. So I can and, and how many psychology faculty members? And I think we've got now 15 full-time faculty. Yeah. About 60% of our courses are taught by contingent faculty, adjunct faculty, and that's you know, system-wide, it, it goes up and down a little bit, varies by department, but system-wide, that's been a major issue that we've been facing. And our union, uh, this might be relevant to you, Susan, as you're thinking about who to include in your union. Our union represents full-time faculty, part-time faculty, and what we call higher education offices, administrative faculty, professional staff as well. So there's a big umbrella there that our union is responsible for. And I think one of the places that the union has been also very effective has been with working on the contingent faculty, the pos position of that, all those adjunct faculty and trying to get them, you know, they now have office hours that are paid. They now get paid for doing required administrative jobs. It's, the union has been calling it a one faculty movement. Again, trying to make them as much faculty as, mm -hmm. as we are and make business cards for them, for example. Silly things like that. Make sure that, that their names are on the office door. It's things that often get overlooked because, oh, they're just temporary. They're not. Right. Temporary. It's professionalizing it. Yeah. 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 We have actually... Our staff are unionized at Seton Hall, which is interesting, it's just not faculty. So, but I, I really like the the pressure that the union can bear on adjunct conditions. That's really interesting to hear. Yeah, this has been really, really helpful. You've answered all the questions that I had and didn't know I had until you started telling me really interesting things. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm not ready to let him go yet. If we're done with the union stuff, I have. I have a couple of, of things I love to ask. <laughs> if you have other union items, I, I want to get to those. No, why don't you move to move on to your, your burning question? Oh there. yeah. I've got a whole file. For this, is, this is the, 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 the trap door time, right? That I'm sitting on. Yeah. We told <laughs> you many of those. We were bringing about we people to switch about. on the door. Exactly. We, we told you we were going to talk about unions, but Eric really had another trick. Yeah, on Back in 1982, you once said... I mean, I do, I do have a few grievances. This is the airing of the grievances. Yeah. No, I don't. Not, not one bit. Vinny, how long have you been at Lehman? I think this is my 32nd year. And was that your first job after grad school? It was. It was. After that glory, those glorious few summers in the Midwest. Yeah, yes. You, you've been there ever since. Yes. What? And, and and it's a college I know because my first college experience was at Bronx Community College in CUNY that was located about a mile away from where Lehman was. My wife's degree is from Lehman College. Okay. So I, 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 I knew it for a long time before I actually got the job off of that. Come so you've been in higher ed for three decades. It's changed dramatically in the last couple of years, but I would love to hear what you think has changed for better, for worse. You've got to be thinking, you got to be on the cusp of retirement. I kind of am. So I would love to hear your thoughts about higher ed and the industry that we all serve in, even though we don't like to think of it as an industry. Wow. I, in that industry sense, I think is one depressing change. 
I think as, as companies have discovered that there's money in higher ed, and I'm not just thinking about the for-profits, but all the, you know, our, our course management systems now and all our consulting systems. And we're now we're spending a huge amount of money on assessment systems that somehow the, the education, the pedagogy, the student development has sort of become a back burn issue. In my state, we, uh, our past governor and even the university people all talk now about colleges, workforce development. I give you, you know, we, we, we're training people to be better McDonald's workers. And that's not, that's, that's not what I originally got in here to do. Lehman, you asked me before, I mean, one of the things we've been lauded for recently is this idea of upward mobility, or social mobility, that we do a fabulous job in changing our students' social and economic mobility. The cynic in me says, oh, that's because we start so low. But for on effect. the other hand, we still do do make a change. And I think we lose sight of that a little bit about just how important a change higher education can be for students, especially for first-generation non-traditional students, which is what Lehman is full of and CCNY is full of. I was just going to say, absolutely, yeah. What, what we do, and I think we, we, we did it well despite horrific unfunding. Thank you. If you were going to, if, if someone was to surprise you, let's say on a podcast without any preparation or warning and ask you to think back to the past 32 years and think about your top two or three highlights or achievements that you're most proud of and ask you on the spot with only giving you about 30 seconds of warning or notice to think about it. What do you think those top two or three things might be? One would be our Psychi chapters winning the then national chapter award because my students never, I, I had such a job convincing them to even do the application because <laughs> they just did not believe that that was an attainable thing mm -hmm. uh, for them, for them to do. And I think also the, the, the students that I've, I've mentored and have gone on to graduate school in general, and especially those that have earned PhDs and those that have become faculty members now have got four that, that are actually teaching in psychology uh -huh. departments. And that's kind of, that's really neat. Not just the idea of, you know, creating little mini me's out there, but the idea that I know when they came to Lehman, none of them thought that even if they had the dream that they get a PhD, that that would really actually happen. Awesome. Well, I, I don't, I don't want to keep, you know, hitting you upside the head with questions you weren't anticipating. I know you wanted to talk about unions, but we sure appreciate your time. Yinka, Susan, anything for Vinny before we cut him loose? He did mention to me before you, you all got on that he was going to, he has some hair coloring to do later this afternoon. He and, he and I have got a matching hair color appointment that we're going to do. <laughs> Can't wait to see his, you going green. <laughs> I think a darker, a darker shade of white. Can you be lighter shade of white? Well, I just want to, I just want to thank you, Vinny. And just for anyone who joined us midstream, we've been talking to Vinny Prohaska from Lehman College at City University of New York. Thanks. Nice. Thanks for representing. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm surprised that they call me. You could have done this. No, no, no. Thank you. Great to have a fresh voice. <laughs> and by the way, the Lehman campus is quite pretty. Yeah. We we wanted to have somebody who was more into it than, you know, like like you, your perspective. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. I are. and also we just wanted to talk to you. Well, that's just longevity. You know, you be around long enough, you gotta pick up some ideas somewhere. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. I'm sure our listeners will too. Yeah, well, thank you for asking me. Thank you, Vinny. Thank you.